come back to this. So now what I was planning to do was to look at dependent origination in even more detail, uh, to look at each link specifically to see how they are defined in the suttas uh, and how this actually, what this means in practice. It's always important, I think, to get these apparently theoretical teachings to make them practical because really everything really comes down to practice at the end. So if you understand how this works in your own experience, then it becomes much more powerful. Otherwise it ends up becoming like just a, a hindrance sometimes if you think too much about it, you worry too much about it. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Okay, so um, uh, first factor here is uh, the factor of uh, ignorance. Uh, and the Pali word for ignorance is avidja. Uh, and uh, the opposite of avidja is vidja, which is then knowledge or understanding yeah, or insight. We have discussed this word before. Uh, and uh, so it is a Ignorance is not entirely satisfactory, but it's not wrong either. You know, you could argue delusion might be a better term, or any of those words might be useful. But delusion, ignorance, lack of knowledge, lack of insight, all of those are appropriate ways of thinking about that first term. So basically it means not understanding the world according to reality. Now if you go with too few pages forward, if you go to page uh, 39, uh, on page 39, this is the definition of ignorance in connection with dependent origination. Yeah, So perhaps not so surprising, it says there in the third paragraph on page 39, it says, what is ignorance? And uh, then it says, not knowing about suffering, not knowing the origin of suffering, uh, not knowing the cessation of suffering, uh, not knowing the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. This is called ignorance. In other words, not knowing the Four Noble Truths, that is the problem. Yeah? So if you don't understand these Four Noble Truths, that is what ignorance is about. Uh, now the understanding of the Four Noble Truths is like flexible, it varies. It's not something that is absolute. You know, sometimes you understand these truths better, sometimes you understand them less more or less. So it varies, and it varies depending on all kinds of causes and conditions. Uh, specifically, it depend varies depending on the qualities of your mind and all of these things, how pure your mind is. Uh, all of that will, uh, uh, will change this degree of avidja that you have. So avidja is a matter of degrees. Uh, and uh, you can be very blind to these things, you can reject the Four Noble Truths completely because you're completely blind, or you can accept them partially. But the only time when you accept them fully is when you become a stream mentor. At that point there is like a revolution in the mind. It's like a turning over and suddenly you see fully what is going on. But even before you become a stream mentor there is a gradation of, of insight. So what that means is that as, we, as you move on this path, yeah, as you change your mental states, a vidya is decreasing all the time. And as uh, we mentioned before, avidja has another cause, uh, uh, which is mentioned specifically in the sutta, as we'll see that later, and that is the five hindrances. Uh, and remember, the path is about purifying the mind, which means it's about reducing the five hindrances. Uh, so every time you reduce the five hindrances, uh, you have less avidja. Yeah? So the path of practice, if it works properly for you, is a gradual reduction in avidja, and a gradual increase in vidya. Uh, so this very first factor of dependent origination is always is changing inside of you, hopefully, if you're heading in the right direction. Uh, yeah, and uh, so every time your meditation goes a bit deeper, if you feel your mindfulness is becoming stronger, uh, if you feel you have more kindness inside of you, more compassion for other beings, uh, if you feel your samadhi is improving in your practice, uh, all of these things are guides that show you that your avidja is reducing and you're looking at the world in a different way. You get a better grasp of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, what is it that you see? Well, what you see, and you will notice for yourself, is that you start to see more clearly where there is happiness and suffering in the world. Uh, yeah, when you have more kindness, actually, you the reason you do that is because you have better understanding that kindness leads to happiness. That's why you are more kind. 
yeah, you have a better degree, you have a better grasp of, of how the things wor works, that is where the kindness comes from. Uh, if you have more mindfulness, it's the same thing. You have more, uh, your mind is more aware of what is going on, uh, and that also allows for more insight and understanding of what's happening. Every time you feel very peaceful, you know that that peace is a better state, it's more happiness than the state when you are not peaceful. Uh, if you have a deep state of samadhi, you get addicted to samadhi, uh, you know that that is even more happiness than anything you had before. Uh, so you start to understand where happiness really lies, uh, and that then changes your avidja. And then when the avidja is changed, uh, you have less avidja, that fe changes your sankharas, it changes your choices, uh, you choose more wisely, you choose where there is happiness, yeah, according to reality. And then that goes through the whole chain of dependent origination, it affects the whole thing. Yeah. And also that you then have less dukkha as a consequence as well at the end of the day. So this whole thing kind of changes with uh, uh, the degree of avidja that you have. And eventually you get reborn is a, in a higher realm as a consequence. Uh, and further down the track you eliminate everything. Yeah. So it's, it's a flexible system yeah, that changes according to what... Uh, so even reducing avidja a little bit uh, is already beneficial. Uh, you don't have to reduce it 100% straight away. Every time you reduce it, uh, it will be beneficial to you. Uh, so um, anyway, let's uh, have a look at a few different ways that uh, avidja is talked about uh, in the suttas, or vidja is talked about. Uh, one of the ways it is talked about, we discussed briefly before, uh, is in terms of the three, the te vidja, uh, the three knowledges, uh, which uh, parallel the three knowledges that the Brahmins uh, were talking about. Uh, and uh, the te vidja in Buddhism is uh, the understanding, the recollection of past lives, the understanding of the laws of kama, and then also the uh, arahant insight into dukkha. These are the three knowledges uh, in uh, 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 when they are talked about as the te vidja. Yeah? So this is one way of thinking about uh, lack of insight or lack of understanding here. Yeah? So how does that relate to this framework? Is it the same as what we're seeing here? We're here talking about Four Noble Truths. Uh, how does that relate to the te vidja? And it actually relates very closely here, yeah? because the te vidja, the first one, is the uh, insight into past lives. Well, that is the same thing as understanding dukkha. Yeah, if, you have full, if you have insight into the past lives, basically it means you have a grasp of dukkha, yeah, a very deep grasp of it. Uh, so it's similar to the first one. It's not exactly the same, but it's closely related to the first of the Noble Truths. Uh, it may not yet be the full insight, but it's getting a long way on the way if you see past lives. Uh, the second one, which is then the insight into kamma, the causes by which this whole process of samsara carries on, uh, uh, then you are, it's very similar to the second one of the f uh, Four Noble Truths, yeah? the cause of dukkha. So the second insight of the Tevijas, uh, Kamma, is very similar to the second one of the Four Noble Truths. And the last one, uh, which then is the insight into Arahantship, uh, is similar to the Third Noble Truth, which is Nibbana, yeah? the insight, uh, the ending. Actually, it's all, they are exactly the same, in fact. Uh, because there you have the full insight into things. And the only one which is not reflected is the path, the fourth noble truth. But the path is always implied by the three earlier ones. Yeah? If you have insight into the early ones, the path anyway kind of follows along. Uh, you understand what the path is. Uh. So the different ways of looking at the Tevija again, they are the same. They coming from slightly different viewpoints, uh, just to give you a different idea uh, of how the Dhamma works to give you a broader picture of things, uh, but they are really the same way of looking at the world. Uh, so either way you approach this, uh, the result will basically uh, be the same. So all of those ways we talked about before, about right view, about samsara just being this kind of traveling on and on and on, all of that is also related to all of these things. Uh, they're not different, uh, they're just different angles of approaching the same problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, that is avidja, and then the vidja is the opposite of that. Uh, so again, the uh, interesting and the important point here is that avidja, well first, as Venerable was saying, avidja is uh, 
supported by Avidja. So the more Avid if you have Avidja already, you will have more Avidja in the future. But uh, the good news is that the Buddha came into the world. Yeah, the Buddha came and he said, yeah, wait a minute, don't allow that Avidja to block you. Huh? So because of the Buddha came into the world, he is actually the spark that makes it possible to get out of Avidja. But if it hadn't been for the Buddha, it's almost impossible. Yeah, it's almost impossible if avidja causes more avidja in the future, then how are you going to get out? It's almost impossible to get out, unless you happen to come across a teacher like the Buddha who shows you the way out. Otherwise this kind of a trap, a trap that is self-sustaining in a sense, samsara. But then the Buddha comes along, the eye of the world, yeah, that's why it's called the eye of the world. Because it opens up and it allows you to see things differently, because he has sees seen things differently. Yeah. And this shows you the incredible importance of Kalyanamitta on the Buddhist path. Once you understand that it's almost impossible to see things on your own, to grasp things by yourself, then the Kalyanamitta becomes almost becomes essential. Yeah, without the Kalyanamitta there is no way out of this. And this shows you that the idea of the Buddha, the Kalanamitta, being a fundamental part of the Buddhist path, without which, really, there is no escape. And we will see later on, the Buddha actually talks about this in the suttas. He takes this idea of avidja as the starting point, another sutta we'll look at later on, and he asks, well, how, do, how is vidja, the opposite of avidja, how is it arrived at? And it takes it step and step back and shows the root cause for getting out of avidja. In other words, for having final knowledge, for having understanding. The root cause is the word of the Buddha. Yeah, without that, it can't happen. The sapurisa sangseva, which means like associating with true people, and which is the root cause there. It's similar to kalanamitta and all of that. So without that, no starting point. And Noble Eightfold Path is very similar, yeah? It starts out with the right view. That right view originally comes from the Buddha. Same idea again. That is the starting point of all of this. So that is why there is this idea of ignorance supporting ignorance. You need some trigger, you need something there to kind of break that circle of reinforcing states, and that is the Buddha's word. And this is why it is so useful to come back to the word of the Buddha, yeah, again and again, uh, to read the suttas, to understand what right view is, uh, because it actually enables you to break this cycle. Uh, if you not, don't use the word of the Buddha enough, uh, you will tend to be trapped by the way you're already looking at things. Uh, it's not enough to do it once, you have to keep on reflecting on these things, keep on coming back to them. Uh, and uh, then, gradually, gradually, you unravel the conditions that are so strong and so powerful inside of you, uh, and you enable yourself then to gradually see the truth uh, of these things. Uh. So, five hindrances are the cause for avidja, yeah, or the condition for avidja, not the cause, but the condition. Uh. Five hindrances go up, uh, avidja becomes stronger, stronger. Five hindrances go down, uh, avidja becomes weaker. Uh. And this is why Again, the Buddhist idea, the path of purification is so powerful. We're trying to purify the mind because that is what eliminates these five hindrances. And that path of purification, again, it starts with um, practicing morality by body and speech, and then it moves on to the morality of the mind, and the final purification happens through meditation practice, and then the really pure mind is the samadhi mind. That's why the samadhi mind is able to make that breakthrough, yeah, because it is that pure mind. And that's when avidja can be undermined completely, yeah? because the mind is completely pure. The support network of ignorance, uh, of uh, avidja, uh, is gone. Because the support is gone, then avidja is weak, and it becomes vidja, can become vidja instead. All you need to do then is to look at the five khandas in the right way, if you look at them in the right way, bang, it's undermined. And then that's when revolution in consciousness can happen. Suddenly you see the world entirely differently. And that's what stream entry is all about. Uh. So this is avidja, yeah? It is both caused and uh, uh, it has always been there, but it has conditioning factors and that is what makes it possible for us to break through. Uh. So how? Is, am I 
do people understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's more difficult to understand after lunch, right? Uh, <laughs> I know what it's like. It's always kind of the uh, everything is more difficult at this time. But uh, so uh, and uh, it's probably more difficult for me to explain as well after lunch, actually. Uh, so <laughs> I will try to keep on going. And if if it is becoming unclear or you know I'm just babbling on kind of <laughs> too much, please stop me and ask some questions or whatever, so we can get that balance and try, try to really figure out what's happening here. It's difficult to understand, but often also it's not so easy to articulate some of these things. You know, you have to kind of be, it's hard to teach these things in a way. It's interesting to teach these things, I, I enjoy it, but it's, uh, to articulate these ideas is not always so, so easy here. But, uh, so we just do our best uh, and hopefully we will gain something out of, out of this. Uh. Okay, so let's then come to the back to the idea of uh, ignorance conditioning sankharas uh, or activities. So avidya conditions choices, conditions or activities or volitional formations, whatever it is your preferred rendering for that word sankhara. Uh, maybe creation we should put, put in there. So ignorance conditions, delusion conditions creation. Uh, you think creation is great, yay, create, create happiness, yay. Don't know what happiness is, oh, wait a minute, uh, maybe I made a mistake. Yeah. So how does this work then in more detail? So. When you start out, yeah, you think that happiness is out there in the world to be taken by traveling here and there, by eating this kind of food and that kind of food, by enjoying all these different kinds of relationships and by having this kind of car and this kind of house and all of these kind of things. And as you do that, you then, because you think that that is where happiness is, yeah, remember I was talking about the, uh, the um, ignorance as being the main aspect of ignorance being first noble truth, yeah, not understanding happiness and suffering. So you look for happiness in the wrong place. What the Aryas say is uh, happiness, or what the noble ones, ones say, sorry, the ordinary people say is happiness, the Aryas say is suffering. Yeah. So the ordinary people always tend to go for happiness in the wrong place. That is the problem. Yeah. That is the first noble truth, but the first noble truth implies also impermanence. Yeah, the reason why things are suffering is precisely because they are impermanent, they are unreliable, you can't control them. So anicca and dukkha are both part of that first noble truth. But so is anatta, because anatta is the idea that we cannot really, there's nothing there to control things either. We cannot even control the world, uh, because that control that we have is also conditioned. Uh, there is no real control over things. Uh, there is no final entity inside that is you know, able to uh, make things be in a certain way. Uh, like that controller is conditioned and that controller is deluded. Uh, that controller is not apart from those deluded conditions. Uh. So, but because we then have all these ideas about where happiness is, uh, but it happens to be in the wrong place, then we have the sense of self that says, I am in charge, I am in control, I can get that happiness. For that reason, we then apply ourselves to get, find happiness in the world. Uh, yeah, it's quite uh, logical in a sense, yeah? So we do that, and then as we do that, uh, we then uh, create, we make things, we make these things happen. And in that process, as I said before, of making things happen, uh, of making, creating happiness in our lives, we make karma, because this is exactly what karma is, is this intention of making things in the future, that is karma, karma is intention, right? This is all intention based. So, then in this process, because we are seeking for happiness and sensual pleasures, some of the time we will be seeking that in the right way, we will be seeking that in a way where we come from a good heart uh, and we, we care about people, we care about things uh, and then we make good karma because we're coming from the three wholesome roots of karma, the amoha, adosa, aloba, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, non-desire, non-ill will, non-confusion. Uh, uh, so because of that we are making good karma. But sometimes because we are seeking for happiness in the sensual realm, if someone blocks us 
from accessing that happiness in the sensual realm. If we have to fight maybe a rival, yeah, in a, we're in a romantic relationship, there is a rival there or something like that, uh, it can lead to, if there's rivalry, it can lead to lot, making a lot of bad karma in that rivalry. We see that all the time happening in the world. Someone is getting in your way. Yeah? Or in the office, you have office politics, uh, yeah, where people are kind of uh, maybe fighting for the promotion or getting the best position with the boss or, or whatever it is, yeah? And again, similar kind of things. In those situations, when you're fighting for the sensual pleasures in the world, a position in that world, uh, you make bad karma because of trying to kind of get yourself above someone else. And then you put them down and you say bad things about them or you do bad things about them. Uh, so if you make the sensual world all there is, if that is where you think all happiness is, uh, then you will do immoral things uh, as part and parcel of uh, uh, your pursuit of sensual pleasures. Uh, this is just the way the world is because you have wrong view. Uh, you are deluded about this. Uh, and then, of course, those actions you do uh, will then affect your consciousness. Uh, and if you do what many people do, which is don't really worry so much about the good actions, uh, but you tend to get into a little bit at least of the bad actions, you are gradually dragging yourself down, uh, feeling bad about yourself, feeling dark inside, uh, feeling negative, uh, making a negative personality. And you can see these people in the world, they just get really uh, negative and dark and their life isn't really worth very much after a while. Uh, and uh, it's a terrible life to live, uh, but they are precisely because they are deluded. They don't understand. They're trying to look for happiness in the wrong place and then they live badly as a consequence. And that's what I'm saying. If someone treats you badly, someone does the bad thing, instead of getting angry, you should have compassion for them. Because all the reason why they are the way they are is because they are deluded. They don't know that they're creating suffering for themselves. They think they are pursuing happiness, when in fact they are pursuing suffering. Isn't that kind of sad? So here everyone wants to be happy in this world because they don't understand where happiness is. They pursue dukkha, they pursue suffering when in fact they want to be happy because of misunderstanding. They are in the darkness, they are deluded. Have compassion for people like that. Even if they get in your way, they create problems for you. Yeah, They are the ones who have the real problem. And then they drag the consciousness down. The consciousness becomes darker and darker and darker in this way. And after a while, they are in a very dark place. And of course, eventually that will lead to very bad consequences in the future. And then, as you start to maybe understand a little bit about the reality of the world, and probably most human beings have some understanding that kindness is good. Yeah, deep down we probably understand that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be reborn as human beings in the first place. So uh, if you understand that, then uh, you try to kind of balance things out a little bit. You try to live a bit with more kindness, yeah, because you, you intuitively know that is right, then you start to make more good karma instead. Uh, you still make a lot of bad karma because you still seek for most of your happiness in the sensual world, but it's a bit more balanced. So your consciousness ends up being not so dark. It's more mixed with dark actions and bright actions. So it's more flat, yeah? So you, know, you move in the more, f instead of moving in a downward trend, you re more in a, in a flat trend. But then you start to think about the spiritual life. You start to understand uh, the way we have been talking about things now, that actually kindness is really the way to go. Because when you're kindness, what you do is that you're changing your inner life. You understand that the, inter the external things of sensual existence, well, uh, they are so unreliable anyway. Why pursue those? I know I'm going to have to give them all up. Everything I'm going to have to give it up when I die at the latest, probably before then. Uh, what's the point of investing in all of this stuff that's going to, I'm going to die from it anyway. It's going to all disappear. So you start to change your priorities. You ask yourself, how can I have more sustainable happiness? And then you move towards the spiritual life instead. Uh, and you start to act more. What becomes important to you is how you act, not the result so much. How can I be more kind? How can I be kind consistently? How can I not care about what really happens in the material world and just focus on the kindness? 
That's how you start to think in this particular case. Uh, yeah? So you, and then when, as you do that, uh, and as you purify yourself, uh, you become better and better at making good choices consistently. Uh, and the better you are at making good choices consistently, the more you are lifting up your consciousness. Uh, the more it becomes brighter and purer and better. Uh, yeah? And until eventually you get this really wonderful, beautiful consciousness out here somewhere, uh, which is really lifted up to a very, very high level. Uh, so, and of course then, that carries on yeah, in the future again. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, and uh, this is where it gets very interesting, because it even goes to the point where you uh, carry on, you do good acts, but your acts are so good that, in a sense, you elevate yourself entirely out of that sensual plane. Uh, and that is where the possibility then, in the future, is to be reborn in a very high state of consciousness, like the Brahma Loka. Yeah? And where you even stop making choices uh, altogether, yeah, there is no choice anymore in these realms, uh, and there you are getting very close uh, to what it means to attain Nibbana. Yeah, when the, because the end of choices means the end of consciousness, uh, so if you really do attain the end of choices completely, you won't get reborn. Uh, but this is more like a temporary ending of choices when you go into the jhana states. Uh, yeah, so it's still, there's an underlying choices, if you like, the under the um, Anusayas, the underlying tendencies that will still make you be reborn, uh, but you're getting very close at this particular point. Uh. So th this is how consciousness then depends yeah, on, your, uh, on your choices, uh, and how it kind of either you drag it down, it stays in the middle, or you lift it up, and all of these things, uh, all depends on how you, how you live your life. Uh. So, um, uh, not so hard to understand, yeah? It's not, not, not that difficult to see what's going on here. It all depends on the degree of avidja and vidja you have and all of these, these things. Uh. And then, uh, when consciousness is uh, uh, then established uh, at, the, uh, uh, at a certain place when you die, uh, well, that means that is where it is standing. Then you continue at that realm. Then you get reborn in a place that accords with that consciousness. Uh, that is that what then happens next, as I was mentioning before. Uh, I did explain this before already, just uh, in a little bit less detail perhaps, uh, but the same principle applies. And then you kind of move on into the next one, uh, next life, next realm, according to that station. Uh. So, um, that is then uh, the uh, first factors of uh, dependent origination, how they, how they work out, uh, yeah? And uh, it is uh, fascinating what then happens, of course, as you get insight into this. Because as you get insight into it, I have now looked at the idea of getting insight into dukkha and sukkha, but uh, have getting insight into anatta, of course, is also very important part of this. Uh, because as you get insight into anatta, non-self, uh, you start to understand the feebleness of all the doing. The doing itself is problematic, yeah? because the doer is uncertain, the doer is not really in charge, the doer is deluded, the doer doesn't really know where to find happiness. In fact, the doer is part of the problem. Uh, and when you understand that the doer is part of the problem, that is when you start to stop doing altogether. Uh. Yeah, this is kind of one of those, this is why the insight into anatta is so profound, uh, because you understand the doing itself in the first place. Uh, the reason you do, there's two reasons why you do, because you think that you will create happiness in the future, uh, and because you identify with the doer. You think the doer is me, you enjoy doing it, uh, but you only enjoy doing and creating uh, <coughs> as long as you think that that creator is good, uh, that the creator is a uh, something that makes you happy. And as long as you identify it with it, it will make you happy. Uh, but the moment you don't identify with it anymore, which happens when you see anatta, then you can see the doer for what it is. Uh, and it is a pain. Yeah, it's actually unpleasant to do. Uh, and this is what you see in meditation practice. Uh, as you go deeper and deeper in meditation, the more still the mind is, the more pleasant it is. Uh, when you come to complete final non-doing, uh, yeah, that is where the maximum amount of happiness is. Uh, well, not maybe maximum, but getting very, very close. Uh, you understand that doing 
actually is a pain. Uh, and then you give up doing altogether, and then you're getting very close to enlightenment. You can now see why the jhanas are so close to enlightenment, uh, because right there in the formula of dependent origination, you already understand that the sankharas are problematic. Uh, if you keep on getting the jhanas and you have right view, it's only a matter of time before you give up doing altogether if they are problematic. Why do? Why have sankharas if they are painful and they cause dukkha? And then uh, this is then translates into uh, your vijnana becoming uh, no longer having an interest in all this creative activity. And we'll see this is actually now coming into the cessation process, all of this, uh, but then the whole process ceases uh, actually on that basis. So, delusion uh, moving into uh, sankharas. Uh, and then vinyana, lack of delusion, moving into lack of sankharas, or better, smarter sankharas, more wise sankharas, uh, moving into a lighter and brighter vinyana. Yeah? This is how this process works. You get reborn accordingly. Yeah? And then, as I mentioned before, once you have been reborn, uh, yeah, the consciousness is stationed in a certain place, uh, then you are uh, set in that life. You're Kandas have a certain limit to them in, in that life, uh, and that those limits are given by the realm that you have been reborn in. Uh. So, uh, dogs have dog kandas, uh, yeah? human beings have human being kandas, uh, devas have deva kandas, uh, ghosts have ghost kandas, uh, and uh, so it's up to you to decide which kandas you want, if you want any kandas at all, uh, which ones you prefer. Uh. And that is, and all of those groups of khandas will then vary depending on where you have been born. Uh, you will feel differently in each of those realms. Uh, you will perceive differently. You will will differently. Yeah, and all of this. Uh. So uh, that is what name and form really is about. Name and form is about the rest of your consciousness. Yeah, the, the rest of your mind, rather, apart from consciousness, uh, and how you experience the world around you. Uh. So, if that is the case, if name and form is about the other four khandas apart from consciousness, then why is it called name and form? Why isn't it just called the four other khandas? Why isn't it called Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Rupa? Why is it called name and form? It's kind of strange, isn't it? Why, why, why not just kind of come straight out and call it name and form? Well, to find out, let's now go back to those definitions again that we were looking at before, because they will maybe give us a hint uh, as to what is going on here. So, <coughs> let us go through these definitions on page 39, the beginning ones anyway. So we started out by saying that the de definition of ignorance or delusion is the not knowing of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, the definition of sankharas is, as you might expect, the three kinds of sankhara, body, speech and mind. Yeah? All sankharas are included within body, speech and mind. And then you can subdivide those into uh, good sankharas or negative sankharas, if you like, depending on whether you're making good choices or bad choices. Uh, but everything, all choices you make, are included within those three categories. There's a comprehensive category of sankhara. And then from those sankharas, then come the vijnana, the consciousness, and it is here classified as the six classes of consciousness. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousness. And the purpose of that classification is just to point out that all kinds of consciousness are included with dep within dependent origination. Uh, so any kind of consciousness you have will then be conditioned in this way by the sankharas. Yeah, your whole conscious experience depends on sankharas. Uh, it is not just some consciousness, everything is included. These six classes are exhaustive. Uh, there is nothing outside of these six classes of consciousness, and it's actually said specifically in certain places in the suttas. Uh, there is no seventh class which is somehow uh, beyond this and where you kind of can experience some kind of permanent conscious state. No, everything is conditioned in this particular way. Uh, so your entire mental experience will depend on that. Uh, and then that consciousness, if you go to the previous page, uh, page 34, 
Now here you find the definition of name and form, Nama Rupa in Pali here. And uh, the definition of name and form then is feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention. That is called name. Yeah, and form, that is the four primary elements and form derived from the four primary elements. This is called form. Such is name and form. Therefore it is called name and form. <laughs> so, um, what does this mean? Yeah, it is, may not be entirely clear what the point of all of this is, but the point of all of this is that uh, uh, intention here is chaitana, yeah, very often called intention. Attention is manasikara, and both of these are aspects of sankara. Yeah, they both are movements of the mind, they are choices, they are intentions, they are uh, activities of the mind, if you like. Yeah. So, and contact is really just another way, also, it's also part of these mental khandas in a certain way. It is not really, doesn't really have a life on its own contact, it's just made up of these other ones in a certain way. So if you look at those names there, those aspects, really they are just the feeling, perception and sankara, that's what they are. are yeah? So the definition of name and form is actually defined here in terms of the other three mental uh, khandas plus the rupakanda coming afterwards. Uh, rupakanda, the four primary elements, what are they? Well, they are just the four elements we always talk about. Yeah, the uh, form, the physical element, the, uh, uh, the wind element, the fire element, and the water element, uh, four primary elements. And form derived from that, what does that mean? Well, what that means is not actually explicitly said anywhere in the suttas, so you have to go, to understand this, you really have to go a little bit outside of the suttas, like a bit into the Abhidhamma and the commentaries. Sometimes commentaries in Abhidhamma can be helpful uh, when they kind of align with the suttas. So here they will say things like the ear, for example, your ability to hear, yeah, the ability to have hearing or to taste the tongue, if you like, or the nose. These are derived elements that make contact through those sense spaces possible. Uh, yeah, so this is part of how the rupakanda works to allow sense impressions to happen beyond, uh, through all the senses. This is derived form that makes that happen. Uh, otherwise, you, you, it's trying to kind of make sense of reality. Remember that, this is how this uh, works out. Uh, so, if you look at that, it becomes quite clear that name and form really is just the four khandas apart from consciousness. Yeah? That's really what it means. But we still are left with the question, why does the Buddha call it name and form? Why is it called Namarupa? Why is it not called the four khandas? Uh, this is like a mystery here. Yeah? This is like you, uh, you know, you need, ah, where, somebody gave me, ah, this is what you need to solve mysteries. Uh, magnifying glass. Uh, <coughs> I think I said my eyesight was not getting so good, so they gave me a magnifying glass, which is really nice. Now I can start to see better, perhaps. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so uh, to solve mysteries, magnifying glass always comes in handy. Sherlock Holmes always had a magnifying glass with him. Uh, so now we're going to put this magnifying glass on there. So what is going on here is that you have to understand the way that uh, the world was spoken about prior to Buddhism. Remember, the Buddha is reacting to the world as it was. Yeah, he has to use the vocabulary of his time to make sense of things. And uh, the world was often described in this way in pre-Buddhist times. Nama Rupa were very important categories. They spoke of the mind, mind as Nama and they spoke of material phenomena as Rupa. <coughs> So sometimes the Buddha would use these existing categories uh, to uh, use them in such a way as to put them into his own teaching uh, so that it would kind of merge. Yeah? It people would be easy for people to understand what was going on because they were used to those categories before. Uh, and then you get a definition afterwards like this whereby then the Buddha makes his own definition out of those things. Uh, but he uses the pre-existing categories. You always have to do that. Yeah, you're given a certain culture, you're given a certain language, and you have to use that and then help people to understand your new teaching in terms of existing 
categories, an existing vocabulary that is already there. And that's why he uses this. Uh, and there is an interesting uh, uh, research has been done to show that uh, some of the pre-Buddhist teachings in India also had a kind of dependent origination, yeah? A kind of similar way of looking at things. Uh, they're talking about the origin of the universe. Uh, this is the Brahmanical way of thinking about things, uh, talking about the origin of the universe and in the beginning they said there was just darkness yeah there was all there was, was darkness and then from that darkness that's like ignorance yeah darkness from that darkness emerged this will or this doing or this something yeah came from that darkness that's like sankara and then that sankara somehow uh, gave rise to cognition yeah the idea of being aware and then that, it's like vinyana, something that I can't remember the exact details, but there's a certain parallel there to how the world was viewed at that time and how dependent origination was then put together by the Buddha to counter that previous idea and to make sense of it. Uh, yeah, it sort of makes sense because you, the Buddha has to start somewhere when he brings out his ideas. But to make sen sen to make create new ideas, you have to base it on something. Nothing comes out of a vacuum. Uh, so you have your insight, uh, and then you build up your, uh, uh, your position, your way of looking at the world from that insight and the pre-existing ways of looking at the world. That's why Nama Rupa is used in this particular way. Uh. So uh, Nama Rupa then really is the pre-Buddhist way of thinking about the mind. Why do, why do they use the word Nama in this way? Because Nama means name. Yeah? And if you think about the English word name, it's actually the same word in Pali as it is in English. Yeah? Name, Nama, it's actually exactly the same word. And um, do you have that in, in uh, Malay? The word Nama, yeah? Malay, exactly. So there you can see it's almost like everywhere. Yeah? It's a very kind of, it started in India and spread out over the whole world, uh, this, these words. Uh. So, um, because when you name something, yeah, you categorize it, yeah? It is like you give it a perception. So you say, this is a human being. Yeah? So once you have said, given it the name human being, then you have kind of given a categorized something. Then you have a perception, human being. It fits with a certain category of beings, yeah? These are human beings. Or a cat, then you can make sense of it. Uh, or like you say, colors, yeah? We distinguish between green and blue. Yeah? So then we have a, some kind of distinction between them because we're given them a name. If you didn't have the name green and blue, they would kind of merge into one color. Uh, and that has actually been shown experimentally that if you don't have that, some cultures apparently don't have that distinction uh, because you don't have it, they don't actually see the difference between green and blue. Yeah, they seem more similar than they would seem to us because we have that distinction. Uh, so by giving things a name, you're categorizing it, you're making perception work. Uh, perception is a very big part of the naming activity. Yeah. But naming is also to do with volition. Yeah? You, you're using your will, you're making, making things, uh, you're creating things according to categories. So it's also a volitional activity. And with perception also comes feeling. Feeling is an aspect of perception. Feeling in a certain way, uh, always comes with perceiving things in a certain way. So it's very closely related to the mental khandas. Uh, and that's why this nama uh, is used in this way in, uh, in, in pre-Buddhist Indian society. Uh, it's not important what I'm saying. I'm just kind of pointing out that there is a reason for this strange thing, yeah? That the Buddha uses a, a category which is a, uh, different from the way he normally uses things and why he actually uses it in that way. To us it doesn't make much sense, but in that context it would have made a lot of sense to those people who were there. Uh, they would straight away understand what Nama was. It was a certain aspect of the mind to do with naming. That's why it was called that. So then, all of these things, once you get Reborn, they are then fixed according to that category into which you are reborn. Uh, and then you perceive, you live that life uh, in that way uh, because of being fixed in that particular category. Yeah, whether you are reborn as whatever, whatever it is. Uh, 
And uh, it's not so nice because it is fixed. It means that you are stuck, yeah? For that one life you are stuck with that Nama Rupa. You can't really get out of it very much. So you are stuck. If you're stuck in the Deva realm, okay, not so bad. You're quite happy. If you're stuck as a ghost, it's a bit more miserable. If you're stuck even further down, well, it gets really miserable after a while. So this is why. This, uh, uh, and this, this is the idea. You get stuck for a lifetime. <coughs> Flexibility happens between lives, and in that lifetime you are largely stuck. Nama Rupa is fixed, if you like. That is what that is about. So, um, when Nama Rupa is fixed in this way, then you will uh, achieve a certain, you, have, you still have, will have the senses, yeah? The number of senses you have will depend on the kind of being you are. Most beings will have six senses. Uh, but as you move up the uh, uh, hierarchy, higher and higher up, you will have less and less senses. And some, apparently some of the sensual realms that are very high, they even have fewer, fewer senses as you, as you go up. Uh, and then eventually when you get to the uh, Brahma Loka, uh, you will only really have one sense left at that particular point. Uh, yeah, you give up all the other five senses, and really the mind sense is all that actually uh, remains. Uh, in the Arupa Lokas, uh, beyond the Brahma Loka, uh, then there is uh, even the mind sense is getting narrowed down to only mental phenomena in that mind sense. The mind sense can take both uh, non mental phenomena and mental phenomena. So in the Arupa Lokas, there's only mental phenomena left. Uh, so this, even the number of senses varies depending on how high you go. Yeah? This is not so important. I don't worry too much about it. The main point is that when you have Nama Rupa, the senses are part of that. Yeah? As I was saying before, the derived form is the hearing, or the ear, the nose, the tongue. They are derived from the form, the rupa realm. So it all comes together with that. It's a package deal. Once you get it, you get everything here. And uh, then, depending on where those senses are reborn, if you are reborn in a nice realm, yeah, you will have nice contacts. So if you're, if you're your senses happen to be reborn as part of this Nama Rupa package and Vijnana package in a nice realm, you will have nice contacts. That's what happens in nice realms. You will see nice things. You will see nice sights. You will have a nice body, a light body. You will have nice mental feelings, because that's what happens in these higher, higher realms. Yeah? But if those senses have been reborn in a lower realm, you will have bad contacts, contacts that lead to pain and problems. Uh, so the ability of those senses to operate uh, will depend on the realm you are in. Uh, and the contacts will be different depending on the realm you are in. Obviously, that's what it means to be in a realm, is what you contact. So what do we contact? We contact kind of a mixture, yeah? I don't know, you, how do you, what are you contacting right now? Uh, are you contacting something nice or something not so nice? Uh, it's quite nice, yeah, yeah, quite good. Uh, you see what you kalyanamittas around. You see uh, what else do you see? You see a few tables. You see coffee. Coffee. Oh, I forgot about coffee. <coughs> Let's get back to important things. So. <coughs> so this is what happens in the central, in the human realm. You can contact coffee. In the animal realm, you cannot contact coffee. Imagine that's a lot of dukkha. So you enjoy it while it lasts. So. In the Deva Loka, do you have coffee in the Deva Loka? Does anyone know her? <laughs> Maybe special coffee, kind of Deva, Deva coffee, really even better here. Better than Italian espresso coffee here. So remember, these things are practical, yeah? This, these things are all, this is kind of reality, what I'm talking about here. This is not just some idea, but this is actually how you experience the world. We do contact it, and that contact is what then gives rise to whether experiences are good or bad. And that's what contact is really. It just is that experience. Yeah? In the suttas they talk about contact being dependent on three things. And we did mention this very briefly before. Uh, contact happens, well, uh, you see something, you see this mug. Yeah? And the mug has to be there, otherwise I can't see it. The eye has to be present too 
see the mug, and then I have to engage consciously. Consciously, if I see, if I point my eye towards the mug, but my mind is off somewhere else, if I'm thinking about something, I don't really see it. Yeah, there's no real contact happening. Let's say that um, I'm just listening instead. I don't actually see what's going on. I have to engage mentally uh, with it. Only then does eye consciousness arise. Uh, and when the three comes together, that is when uh, there is a, a, a contact. Yeah, that's when there is experience. Uh, so uh, it's quite a nice mug, isn't it? Uh, so c happy, happy experience. Especially when I wear my glasses, it's even happier. Uh, <coughs> okay. So then the uh, contact comes, and uh, every time there is a contact, there will be a feeling associated with that contact. Every time you have an experience in the world, all the time, there will be feelings that arise. Either it will be a contact that you enjoy. If you enjoy the contact, then by definition it is a pleasant feeling, you like it. If you don't enjoy the contact, it's a bad feeling, it's a negative feeling. And then there are the neutral feelings, when you neither really enjoy it, nor are you averse to the contact. It's somewhere in the middle. This is the three ways we react to all experience. All experience has this impression on us, one way or another. So uh, this is how you how you do that. But what is so interesting about this is that how we contact the world depends in a large part on our mind. Yeah? It is not just the way the world is in a certain way and all contact is the same regardless of what the state of mind is. Our state of mind is completely, absolutely uh, significant in how we experience that contact. So if you are in a good mood, you come here one day in good mood, then everything looks a bit different. Yeah, you know what it's like when you're in a good mood. And if you're in a bad mood, everything looks a bit darker. So how you develop your mind will depend on how you see the people around you, how you contact the world, how if you see something as painful or happy, all that depends on your mental state. And it goes to the point where if you gain full power over your sense, sense impressions, you can see anything you want. You can see it as repulsive or attractive just by a change of perception. Yeah? That is kind of really powerful. And so you can go and have, you have a cold shower or something, and in Australia, cold shower can be really, really cold. Yeah? I mean, in Malaysia, it, only does, it doesn't get that cold always, but uh, if you have a cold shower in Australia, like the water is 10 degrees or something, it's like, whoa, it's really, really cold. And, uh, but actually, even that, if you know how to change your perception, uh, and Ajahn Brahm told me this once, all you do is go into the shower, you change your perception, and the cold shower turns nice. Yeah? Just like that. Uh. And I thought, gee, that's really cool. Uh. <laughs> actually, it's not cool anymore, because now it's pleasant, now it's just nice. Uh. So, but that's how, it, how so these, the contact here is not something that is given. Uh. Remember, this whole process is a condition, conditioned by all kinds of things. Uh. So contact depends on both the object, but also your mental state uh, that receives that object. And by changing your mental state, uh, contacts, the meaning of contact changes, and how it feels, what it feels to you, also changes. Uh. And this is one of the great things about the Buddhist path. This is why a lot of the practice we do by changing our feelings and changing our, changing our outlook and looking at things in a different way and seeing the world uh, uh, with different eyes and purifying our mind, why this has such incredible beneficial effects. Uh, because the way we contact the same world gives rise to new kind of feelings. Uh, we feel different about the world uh, because we are more positive about people around us, people we didn't like, suddenly we start to like them. Uh, or suddenly they are, at least they are neutral uh, because we have changed our attitude, the m our mental, the mind we take with us uh, into that experience is different. Uh, yeah, so this is, kind of, this is very fascinating. Contact is not a neutral thing that just happens. Uh, it happens in a mental context. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so that is a feeling. The idea of feeling always arises in, condition of in the contact. Uh, 
But uh, the feeling itself is not a given. It is only a given once the mental state is given, but we can develop it further here. Anyway, I'm going to stop there here because uh, otherwise uh, things are going to go wrong. So I don't want things to go wrong. So let's just stop there and have a break and we'll see you back again at a quarter to, quarter to three here.